guys and welcome back to Beauty and the Bookcase where we take a book and we make a look. This is why I don't lend out books because they come back looking like death. But regardless of the condition of my poor poor book, today we are going to talk about Sylvia Plath's iconic novel The Bell Jar. Born in Boston in 1932, Sylvia Plath was best known for her confessional style of writing. It was very vulnerable and open, something that not many writers of the day were doing. A victim of a cruel husband and poorly treated mental health, Sylvia Plath often wrote about her depression and unfortunately her life was cut short, I think shortly after this novel was published. Now, her work is still recognized worldwide and she even received a Pulitzer Prize posthumously. But when reading this book, it seems nobody who was actually close to Sylvia seem to understand her struggle or take it very seriously. I will make a quick note here to just say that today's video will mention depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, a suicide attempt, and assault. So if you are sensitive to these topics, this video might not be for you, but there are definitely other videos you can check out on my channel. If you or somebody you know is struggling with suicidal ideation, depression, or any other issue, please reach out to somebody you trust. And if you don't have anybody, I have left links in the description box below with hotlines around the world. So let's take it all the way back to 1953 when 19 year old Esther was actually going to a prestigious internship for a woman's magazine in New York. What should have been one of the best moments of her life seemed to actually be one of the lowest points. Plagued by her depression, the pressures from societal constraints and just the overwhelmingness of life. Esther is more isolated than ever and she's unsure of herself, of the program, and she just feels very isolated. And of course, she's shrouded by this dark, deep desire for her death. This, of course, only worsened when she forces herself to put herself out there and meet a man and during this date, he tries to sexually assault her. After a lot of hardships and a failed suicide attempt, Esther falls victim to malpractice when she is actually put in the first mental hospital that she goes to and her electroshock therapy is botched. Thankfully, after this, she eventually finds herself in a private mental institution where she meets a doctor who actually manages to successfully treat her and she's also able to reconnect with an old friend from high school who had dated a guy she was still kind of attached to even though he wasn't that great for her. Deciding to break social norms, Esther decides to just casually have sex with this professor. However, her first sexual experience ends up in a hemorrhage. Terrifying experience, but thankfully she's safe. The novel ends on quite the vague note where Esther, I think she's supposed to appear in front of like the mental hospital council and we don't know the result of it so it's kind of left up to interpretation whether Esther will finally be able to leave the mental hospital feeling better and happier about herself or if unfortunately there was no way to actually fight the darkness that was inside her. Now I'll be honest with you, what drew me first to this book and what I loved so much about it is how absolutely vulnerable it is. It doesn't try to sugarcoat the darkness. It doesn't try to have it played off as, oh, well, she got married and then that fixed everything. You know, there isn't a quick fix and we don't even know at the end if there is going to be a solution if there is hope for her. We we hope there is, but I think it's a very realistic depiction of what it's like to live with depression and suicidal ideation. Plath just had a way of just expressing her life through the page and just ensuring that people could see her wounds on every single page. Like Plath, Esther seems plagued by this darkness and hopelessness all throughout the novel and she was quite young she was only 19 and nobody around her really got it or even attempted to they kind of just chastised her and told her that she either had to get married or become a secretary or you know they were just constantly pressuring her to make all these life choices at quite a young age when 
she was just going through so much and this was only intensifying that stress and that anxiety and that depression. Now, when I first studied this novel in class, I remember a few of my classmates actually mentioned that it didn't make sense that she was so sad because on the surface she had a good life, right? She had her mom, she was going to go to this prestigious internship in New York. I don't think they ever describe her as not being at least somewhat attractive. So, you know, it seems like, oh, you know, this is a girl who shouldn't have very many problems, if any at all. And I remember that struck me quite, quite deeply. I don't know if it was just because in fairness during, I read this in my third year of college and my third year of college was not the best time for me mentally. I was going through a lot of stuff. So perhaps it was just me kind of feeling, I don't know, projecting and feeling attacked. But it, it was obvious as you read the, the book and especially there's this one scene and I'll keep referring back to it because it's so impactful, at least it was for me, where she's kind of daydreaming about this fig tree and she says that every time she goes to like reach for one of the fruits, like all of them just like become putrid. And that right there is like the number one indicator of yes, everything in life might seem to be going well, but there's clearly something inside of her that isn't clicking with this reality that everyone's seeing. And clearly, much like my course mates, the people around her didn't wanna take the time to talk to her and figure out what was going on, they just wanted a quick fix because maybe they hadn't had that experience. Maybe they never will, or maybe they were, you know, kind of complacent in a way with the sadness or the frustrations that they felt. And they just kind of went like, suck it up because it's really not that bad. But clearly it was bad for her. And honestly, I will admit that although it's not perfect, in fairness, it was written quite a while ago, I do enjoy that we do have a not so terrifying and evil version of a mental hospital in this novel. Quite often, you know, mental hospitals are used as tropes in movies and TV and even books where mental health institutions are painted as this horrendous place where you're gonna be tortured and where nobody actually wants to help you and everyone thinks you're just crazy and there's like, you know, padded walls and straight jackets. And although, yeah, I mean, we have electroshock therapy in the more retro way where it wasn't exactly the most humane, it does seem to help her and it does seem that the doctors and even her friend, you know, people in this institution care about the patients, they care about each other, they want to see each other progress and get out of the hospital and just live a normal life. Quite frankly, even the vague ending leaves us who do struggle with mental health issues with a hope that we too can overcome whatever it is that we're dealing with. Uh, to be a woman in the 1950s. Well, while we do sometimes romanticize this era, it wasn't exactly all glitz and glam. While we often look back at diner dinner dates and glossy pinup girl photo shoots, the 1950s weren't exactly the dreamy era that we so often make it out to be. And even more for women like Esther. For somebody who had this profound ambition to be a writer and to have her own career that went beyond being a secretary, which was the only job that sort of was expected of women like Esther to do, it was really hard to have that pressure of having to be this perfect woman, perfect virgin, perfect wife and mother when she hadn't even met somebody that she genuinely clicked with who, you know, was actually going to be good to her and worthy of her. And clearly this took a colossal toll on her mental health and played a huge role on why she was so unhappy. When she was so limited by society, it makes sense that she couldn't make a choice. 
I don't think that Esther didn't know what she wanted. I think she just didn't like the few options that she actually had to choose from. There's even a chance that perhaps she wasn't the one rotting the figs. But, you know, it was her mother or her mentor or the society as a whole who saw the dreams that she had and every time she tried to reach for them, they reminded her that that was not her place. Furthermore, even if she did go into married life, her autonomy was further stripped from her because during that time, you know, sex wasn't something that women were supposed to enjoy or want. It was pretty much you just did it to have some kids and to please your man. And while it was normal for men to have sexual desires and sort of engage in sexual activities before marriage, a woman who did this was definitely looked down upon. It just seemed that for women in general, and perhaps for Esther, she, she saw no point in just going into a relationship where her needs and her pleasure were never going to be prioritized and where really any type of affection was just going to become a chore. You know, when all that marriage was promising her was a baby and potentially a happy husband, and after she had experienced that hemorrhage, why would she want that? And speaking of society in the 1950s, Plath held nothing back while she described it. Life became this monotonous thing for everybody where you just made money, you bought things, and you had babies. Meaning there was zero room for the individual's desire. You weren't really somebody, you were just anybody. Now, I'm not saying that there's absolutely anything wrong with wanting to be a wife or a mother or both. They are very fulfilling for some people, but not everyone wants to be a husband or a wife or a mother or a father and forcing somebody into that reality, which is what was expected during this time, clearly is gonna take a toll on someone. Even worse, many times these relationships weren't good relationships. Women faced abuse, whether it was emotional, physical, or financial. They didn't really have many outlets or many ways out. So often they just had to stay. If you couple that with the reality of miscarriages and postpartum depression, in perhaps a time where people weren't as sensitive towards those situations, it would drive anyone insane. This manicured reality that we see so often in magazines seems to really be a veneer for the true suffering of the women who had to live through a lot of dark times. And again, we return to the fig tree. Esther had very few options. She could find a husband and start a family. She could become a secretary. She could live a double life. Or she could wither and die just like the figs. So what's it all about? Well, at its core, the bell jar was clearly a call for help from Plath that people unfortunately ignored. But it was also the reality that so many women who didn't have the platform that she did, who didn't have the voice that she did, were experiencing, and we don't even know their names. Women forced into silence due to societal norms and expectations. Perhaps her depression was simply her reaction to a society that had set her up in a way where she was destined to be unhappy and fail. So what do you guys think about this book? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you want to know any of the products that I use today to create this look, they're going to be in the description box below. Make sure you follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Make sure to leave a like if you liked this video. Subscribe for more videos like these and make sure you hit that notification bell so you know exactly when I upload every Wednesday and Sunday, and I will see you guys next time.